Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody uh, to a very special edition of the uh, Berkman Tuesday Lunch Series. This is, of course, Election Day. So I hope you've uh, voted whether or not you're from here uh, in the tradition we have in Chicago, which is to say early and often. Um, hopefully also in Boston. Uh, so um, I want to um, introduce our a very special guest, Sunshine Hilligus. Uh, but before that, to um, offer a few, uh, a few thoughts. Um, one, uh, a word of warning to let you all know that you are being recorded and webcast and podcast and so forth. So that we can get other folks who don't have the great uh, good pleasure of having this lovely lunch and being here with us in this room involved in our discussions. Um, that uh, Sunshine's going to talk for on the order of... Probably too long. Probably too but long. But you can cut me off. But she's going to want you to interrupt her and engage with her. Yes. And uh, at some point, um, we will uh, devolve into spirited discussion and try to wrap up uh, by about a quarter to two. Um, at which point people will probably linger afterwards and you can have all those side conversations that are so fruitful. Um, and really that's all I wanted to say and perhaps we could begin by just making a loop around the room and everyone giving a very brief introduction of themselves so we know with whom we're uh, sharing this lunch. Start us off. I'm George van Hoboek. I'm a visiting researcher from uh, the Netherlands. I'm Rob Manchari. I'm a storyteller here at Berkman. I'm Yung Tao, a student from Penn Center. Uh, I'm Ping Mao from China. I'm Joseph. I'm a China lawyer. I'm here working for the Scope Family Law. And for you guys in the back, you have to speak up because these kind of sound like jet engines on this side of the. And I'm Dan Jones, Berkman staff. Uh, <coughs> Asher, Berkman staff. David Aria, Berkman fellow. Hi, Alvaro Santana from the sociology department. Becca Tabaski, Berkman staff. Lexi Koss, Berkman staff. Uh, John Burton, the business consultant. Joe Files, HC reports of a current MIT research fellow. From the, night, from the night program? Yes. Welcome. Right. Nice to have you here. I'm a faculty director at UCF in the program. No signal. I'm Eric Engel. I'm working on QGIS uh, uh, here at Berkman, and I too will have to do it in the air. Lavanan Asia, Berkman staff. Jillian Rose, Berkman staff. Ruben Rodriguez, I'm a 1L at the law school. Evan Gracie, Berkman staff. Darius Stavsky, Fulbright fellow. I'm Roxanne O'Meara, Research Assistant with Cooperation Group. Uh, Ethan Zuckerman, Berkman Fellow. I, I voted in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island on my way in today. If you see me heading out, it's only in New Hampshire. <laughs> this is being recorded, which is yeah, illegal, right? right? So. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeremy Goldberg. I'm a 2L. Uh, David Larchelle, Berkman Staff. Corina Di Gennaro, Berkman Fellow. Milan Di Gennaro, Berkman Fellow. And I'm going to not take uh, almost any more of your time, but just ever so briefly to tell you what a great pleasure it is to have Sunshine with us here today as being kind of an old friend of the Berkman Center, um, one of the only, probably the only person who's interested in the same issues that we uh, are uh, within the, both the Gov Department and uh, IQSS, the Institute for Quantitative and Social Science. Um, and so we've had this uh, long uh, and great friendship in which uh, she approaches um, elections, uh, electoral behavior, voting behavior, um, with a particular uh, eye to its quantitative um, uh, studies and integrating um, really interesting aspects of the internet and the things that we care about so much around here. Um, so rather than uh, mangle uh, or misdirect uh, your uh, perceptions of her, I will just give a plug for this relatively new book out this year, The Persuadable Voter, Wedge Issues in Presidential Campaigns, which is not only interesting, but also very handsome. <laughs> uh, I encourage you to find a copy. We have one up here for you to look at. Um, and I will just ask uh, Sunshine to take us away. Great. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And um, yeah, I appreciate 
um, or being so patient in, in whether or not I was going to be able to be here. I was trying to juggle, as I was saying, um, because I do surveys and elections, about the only time I ever get any attention um, from anybody but some boring political science colleagues is, you know, every four years. And so um, I'm delighted to be here to talk about this project, which is, to some extent, an extension of the persuadable voter, an aspect of the persuadable voter. Um, but I also realize that we're, you know, it's election day. So if we want to forego most of the conversation about some of the evidence I'm going to be showing from, you know, the 2000s. For election to talk about some of the dynamics today, I'm more than happy um, to do that um, as well. Because to give you a little bit um, of a you know disclaimer, some of the things I'll be saying today um, it holds in 2008, but there are, were also some notable uh, differences with 2008. We just don't yet have the data back to to say with certainty exactly how things will look. But I think that, that some of the trends I'm talking about um, actually um, do still hold in this election as well. Um, you know, normally when I talk about this aspect of this, this you know, research, broad research project I've been working on, I kind of go through um, an overview of kind of where the state of the literature is in, in the social sciences regarding the impact of information technology on different uh, campaign actors. Um, but I think that this group probably knows um, quite a bit already about how information technology has changed um, the behavior of the media, of the public, of um, politicians. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about those, but, but really what I want to focus on today um, is the impact of information technology um, on politicians. And where a lot of the research that we have seen has focused has looked at how, for instance, it's changed um, the, the campaign fundraising strategy. I mean, there's no doubt that one of the reasons that Obama emerged as the you know, alternative to um, Hillary Clinton was because of his success in um, raising money online. Um, so there's been quite a bit of interest in, in that topic. Um, there's been quite a bit of interest in, in you know, new ways that technology have allowed um, uh, candidates to communicate with voters text messaging, you know, all of the things that, that you are all very familiar with. Um, it has changed how the candidates have tried to get into the headlines. I mean, one of the, the most important things that a candidate can do is, is not just by television advertising, but to get talked about in the media. I mean, that is foremost uh, for one of their goals. And, and the internet and informa information technology has really changed one of the paths by which they can get um, broader media attention. Um, and, and I should say in terms of, you know, I know that, that a lot of people here are interested in, in blogs and the impact of blogs in, in, uh, versus traditional media. And one of the things that we see is that the two of them um, actually work together, that, that when it is that, that a YouTube video or a blog really has an impact is when it is uh, disseminated through the traditional media. And so you see, for instance, a link being provided on the New York Times to, you know, Obama girl or, you know, some, so, so that it's really the two of them working together um, as opposed to uh, them really being kind of at, um, at odds. Uh, but I, what, what I want to focus attention on is slightly different from what I think a lot of people have talked about when they think about technology and campaigning and, and candidates. And that is, is that um, the information environment and the technology available to the candidates has changed not only the style of campaigning, but also the substance. It has changed who it is that the, the candidates are communicating with and what they're willing to say. And that is uh, fundamentally different from what we see a lot of social science research saying. Because the theme of a lot of social science research is, sure, the campaigns are now you know, sending out text messages and they're sending out emails, but that's really just changing the style, right? The, the way that, that candidates communicate rather than anything really um, you know, substantive uh, about their, their messages. And really my argument is, is that, in fact, um, that, that technology has, has fundamentally changed the substance um, of the political campaign. Um, and just to cut to the chase, um, what I'm going to, to argue is that candidates are willing, uh, because of information technology and changes in the information environment, willing to take positions on more issues and more divisive issues than ever before. Um, and so that's what I want to get to in terms of, of, 
of my argument. Um, and just to give an example, in 2004, Bush and Kerry took positions on 75 different political issues in their direct mail. 75 different issues. There is no way that 75 different issues were being discussed in television advertising, um, even you know in the mainstream media in terms of you know the the uh, public debate that people were having. Um, 75 different issues, a lot of them very very narrow, um, and, and those things were made possible because of uh, again changes in in the information environment. Um, uh, just to pitch my book myself, but thank you, Colin, for doing it as well. Um, this is a part of um, the work that I did with the Persuadable Voter, um, but it, in fact, I found it so interesting, this, this one part, that, it, that I'd like to take it further, and so um, it's, I actually am interested in feedback. Sometimes people come and they present a book and they really don't want feedback. I really do want feedback because this is part of um, some ongoing uh, research um, as well. Just to give you a feel for um, how this fits into the persuadable voter, since the persuadable voter, I told you I'm going to be talking about the campaigns and candidates, but the title is about voters. Um, so what, I, what Todd Shields and I do in this book is to look at who it is that is uh, persuadable in the electorate and then what it is the candidates are doing to attempt to sway those persuadable voters. Um, and so we have three key arguments. That the, the first is that the persuadable voters are not the um, just the undecided voters that you hear the headlines about. They're not just independents who oftentimes don't show up. They're um, not the unengaged uninterested. Um, I think maybe you've seen the John Stewart um, clip about the undecided voters. It's hilarious if you haven't seen it. I'm always going to be using that in my classes from now on. Um, but in fact, persuadable voters um, are the, the people who actually show up at the polls um, and who can be persuaded um, are people who agree with the candidates both candidates on different things. And so um, some of those are independents who agree with you know, McCain on tax policy and Obama on abortion policy. And they have to um, uh, resolve this tension between their agreements and disagreements with each of the candidates. Um, but it turns out that once you take into account the fact that, that many independents actually don't show up on election day um, and that many partisans um, are, actually disagree with their party on a number of issues, that the, the majority of the persuadable voters are persuadable partisans. They are partisans who disagree with their policy on an important an issue that's important to them. So um, I call them the otherwise partisans, you know, the, the um, the, the Republican um, who is pro-choice, but otherwise a Republican. And um, if what happens is that pro-choice Republican comes to believe that what is at stake in the election is abortion policy, if that issue is made salient, then that's how they'll vote. They'll vote against their party and on the basis of that cross-pressuring um, issue. Um, the candidates know this. They know that um, they have to uh, build a coalition between their base and um, a set of persuadable voters. And so what they're doing is they're looking for cleavages in the potential opposition coalition um, and any um, issues where people disagree that they can kind of pluck those people away. And so what they do is they, they try and identify those, you know, the Democrats try and identify those pro-choice Republicans and they tell them, Huh, you should vote on the basis of abortion policy. Abortion policy is actually at stake in this election. And, and so they try to increase the salience of that cross-pressuring issue. Um, and they've always tried to do that. So you look back to the Republican Southern strategy where Republicans um, made an effort to you know, talk about anti-civil rights positions in an effort to appeal to white Southern Democrats. That was a wedge um, strategy where they were trying to increase the salience of that cross-pressuring issue. Um, but it is risky to take positions on especially divisive issues like abortion. Um, you know, if you uh, have a TV ad uh, about your um, abortion positions, you risk, you know, alienating all those people who disagree. Um, taking a position on any issues, think of, you know, uh, Daddy Bush and Read My Lips, right? Taking a position on any issue uh, paints you into a corner where you're a flip flopper if you change your mind. And so uh, just Holding all else can, uh, constant, candidates don't want to take positions on issues. Um, but they're able to because of changes in the information environment, um, information technology. Because now what they can do is they can narrowly send messages to individual voters without it being uh, received by the broader electorate. We call it dog whistle politics, right? Where you send a message to uh, those who are intended to receive it without anybody else finding out. And, and that's done through direct mail, political email, text messaging 
messaging and, and, and so on. And so uh, the information environment is really what enables this type of uh, micro-targeting of uh, wedge issues. And so that's what I want to focus, a long way to get to um, what I want to focus on uh, today. <laughs> Um, just to hit home the point, this is just the number of Democrats in the electorate and Republicans in the electorate, and I should have added 2008 on there because what you would have found is in 2004 the number of Republicans went slightly up, and that has since swapped. In 2008, the, the number of uh, Democrats in the electorate um, is, is actually a gap of, say, six percentage points um, in the Democrats' um, favor. But the key point here is just that you can't build a, you can't win from your base alone. And uh, one of the um, explanations for why it is candidates are targeting wedge issues has been they're trying to mobilize their base. And so I want to take on that alternative hypothesis. That's one of the things that, that um, is kind of an alternative theory floating out to, to what I'll be arguing today. Um, just to get to, to uh, the point more quickly, um, again, what, um, what I'm arguing is, is the information environment enables candidates to micro-target different messages to different voters. And there's two key pieces here. One is that you have the technology to narrowly target a message. But you're only going to do that to the extent that you have information about the individual voter that you're going to know what they're going to be receptive to. And so the other piece of the equation is that candidates have more information about individual voters than ever before. And, and really we can trace this to um, the uh, computerized uh, uh, voter registration rolls um, that the Help America Vote Act has mandated. This is the first election in which all states um, have had to have the statewide databases, although most started transitioning and by 2004 had them. Um, these statewide databases of, of um, uh, voter registration rolls means that, you know, candidates have uh, at their fingertips your name, your address, your party registration in most states, um, and your turnout history in most states. And to that, they can merge in um, information about any contributions that you've made, any magazines that you subscribe to, and, and so on. And then they combine with that some, some polling. Um, and for those of you who have, I see, you know, lots of uh, Obama shirts, so those of you who have worked on the campaigns know also that when you've gone door to door, right, that, that you've had a series of questions that, that get mapped back into this database so that the candidates have um, information about what each individual voter um, is interested in hearing about and, and if there are any um, cross-pressuring issues that, that might help in, in pulling them into their uh, camp. Voters, wrong numbers, people. I had a whole list of people that were supposed to be 108 years old. Um, so I'm guessing you were, I mean, if I had to speculate based on the fact that we're in Cambridge, I'm guessing this was on the Democratic side. Yeah. The Democrats are actually um, trying to catch up. Um, to the Republicans in terms of the quality of their database, there are still many errors um, because it's something that constantly has to be updated, right? I mean, you, right, right. Um, and so um, there are definitely errors and actually I'll show you some evidence of how those errors actually affect the, the type of campaign dynamics that we see. Um, so. I just want to run through a couple of examples. This is from 2004. Um, this was a pro-carry piece, uh, not sent out in Cambridge, I suspect. When it comes to politics, I care about two things, my guns and my job. I love it that my guns comes first. <laughs> this will be Arkansas if you don't vote. The Bible will be banned. And this is a man proposing to another man, so gay marriage will be allowed. Um, in this election cycle, here's McCain sending out um, uh, about um, abortion policy. Uh, Obama sending the message that he's a committed Christian. He's not a Muslim. He's a committed Christian. This was sent in southern states, again, not in uh, Massachusetts. Um, so those are just a few examples. I'll go through some more later. But the, the key is that, that um, what we find is that direct mail in particular, but political email is the same way. We just don't have as, as nice of a data source, um, is that um, the the content of this micro-targeted mail is very different from what we see 
in the broader campaign. And so um, in the analysis that we do um, in the book, we look at the issue content of direct mail versus television advertising and find, for instance, that 30% of direct mail pieces um, had wedge issues in them and 9% uh, were just <coughs> abortion, um, gay marriage, and, and stem cell research, whereas 0% Right, of TV ads were like that. And, and that's not quite fair because that rounds down because there was a, a Bush, uh, a pro-Bush abortion uh, television ad, but it was a Spanish language ad. And so it was already kind of targeted to a narrow constituency. And so we get a very different, um, fee, you know, we have a very different content of the campaign when the candidates are able to use information and use um, micro-targeting. Um, of my pieces is missing, but but there was another graph up there as well that I must have accidentally deleted, um, and that is who gets targeted um, is actually um, again they use the information they have to spend their money more efficiently, and that means that they are spending their money on those people who are persuadable, um, or and then they send a little bit to their ones. So the ones are those people they know are going to vote and they know they're going to vote for them. Those people are not ignored, but most of the money is going to um, the, the persuadable voters. And um, like television advertising, they're going to um, competitive states, but um, more than just the state, they also look at the individual, and, and they're in particular looking at those individuals who are going to vote. And so the active or non-active vote history, um, these are all people who are registered voters, but the average number of pieces of direct mail that somebody who had an active vote history, which means they had voted in um, uh, both of the last two elections, um, you had seven, they had 7.3 pieces of ad uh, on direct mail on average, compared to 1.3 pieces for those people who lived in non-battleground states who were registered to vote but weren't active voters. And so one of the, this is from 2004, one of the things that is slightly different about 2008, and, and I think that, um, again, the, um, the media message has perhaps been a little bit overblown about the extent to which the candidates are now going over, you know, mobilizing new voters. Um, it's been a little bit cheaper and easier for Obama to mobilize um, even people without inactive vote histories because he knows that with young voters and African Americans that they're going to break so much in favor for him that if he can get them to the polls that it's a positive. And so you, we see a slightly, I expect once we get some data, that we'll see that this election cycle there was a little bit more effort um, plugged into on the Obama side actually um, mobilizing people that, that don't have an active um, vote history. Um, but even still, the majority of money is going towards those people that are that just need a little boost to to, to get them to the polls. Um, looking at specific issues, I kind of gave you the breakdown, just wedge issues and and so on. Um, again, what what we can do is look at um, direct mail um, versus TV, and again see that the um, content um, is very different. And the issues that are being talked about in television are very broad problems rather than divisive issues. So it's things like health care and education and jobs, right? It's things that nobody disagrees, right, on, on the outcome that we want. We just disagree on the means to get there. And so what you find are these very broad messages. Um, and uh, direct mail is, is, has some of that, but it also has um, things that candidates would never take a position on um, in uh, television advertising. Okay, so this question, yeah. On that last chart, were those all um, majority issues or were some of those wedge issues? That's what I'm trying to figure out because it said healthcare, education, jobs are things everybody agrees about the goal, so it's not a split, it's not a wedge issue. But what about the other issues of the list? They are wedge issues, right? Right, so this is actually just um, kind of a, the top issues that were being talked about <laughs> rather than my definition of wedge issues versus not wedge issues. Um, and so, and actually, I mean, you could think about their, you know, education. Everyone agrees that we want, you know, an educated electorate. Um, there are some education issues that are wedge issues. Vouchers are a wedge issue. And and so this is this is just a, a very broad, you know, you know so. yeah. Okay, so this question of, you know, is this really going, um, are all these kind of targeted messages really going not to the persuadable voters, but to the base? Um, if it was really all about the base, then, then there are a few things that we might expect. Uh, number one, that the messages are being sent um, 
not because they need to persuade these people, but because they want money from them or time from them or right to, to get them to the polls, perhaps. Um, but you find that almost none of the direct mail pieces are actually pure mobilization appeals. If a candidate is sending out a message, a piece of, of, of a campaign message, they never say, go to the polls without also saying, here's how you should vote when you get there, and you know, here's a motivation for you getting there. And so, so almost all um, campaign messages have persuasive content in them. And it's also not the case that most of the um, direct mail pieces, uh, the ground war campaign, are explicitly asking for volunteer appeals or asking for fundraising. So for those of you who might be part of a base, right, you may have gotten some of those. But the vast majority of kind of ground war messages um, are actually not, um, you know, again, like they're not going to the base to try and get them more activated. They're at, instead, they have issue content. They are an attempt to persuade those um, pivotal voters. In fact, I, I like the party labels. This is just whether or not there's, because um, you might think that if it's really just a base strategy, all they need to say is, you know, vote for the Republicans or vote for the Democrats or, you know, remind somebody that, you know, you're a Democrat and so you need to vote, um, get out and vote. But, but oftentimes they don't even want to admit their, their um, party. This is especially the case in this election year. And so I think you look on the Republican side this election year, um, especially at congressional level, and you'll find that, you know, none of their campaign messages um, advertise uh, their party affiliation. But they do, cont again, they, they contain a lot of issue content. Um, this is a little bit of a complicated graph to interpret, but the key thing here is that um, to identify whether or not direct mail pieces were going to the base or to the persuadable people um, um, in the middle, what I did is I just looked at um, strength of party ID from strong Democrat to strong Republican, so this, the dark blue to the dark red. Um, and you look, for instance, um, at the, the pro-Bush moral appeal. So this is the percentage of um, strong Democrats all the way to strong Republicans who received pro-Bush messages that included a moral appeal. If it was a pure base strategy, what you'd expect is that strong Republicans were going to be the ones receiving the most appeals about gay marriage, abortion, stem cell research. But in fact, what we find right, is the blue line and the yellow line are actually higher than the Republican lines. It is the case that the Democrats and independents were more likely uh, to receive that message than were Republicans. And again, that just reflects the fact that these messages were being used to try and peel away um, persuadable voters who they thought they could capture on these moral issues. Um, and just to give some more examples. Um, here's one that's very explicit in, in that appeal. I feel safe with President Bush. I've always been a pro-choice Democrat, but party loyalties have no meaning when it comes to my family's safety. Right? So the, the, the point of the message is to say what, you should be, what should be salient in your vote choice. We know that you have conflicting pressures, but what matters in this election is, is you know, the foreign policy aspect. And you see this kind of on a broader campaign basis as well, where, you know, each side kind of is trying to focus attention. Obama's trying to focus attention on the economy. Um, McCain, you know, it, his, his hope was to, you know, focus attention um, on foreign policy. Uh, this is from the Florida uh, Republican Party. Fidel Castro endorses Obama. I love this guy. This was actually not true. This, I mean, it's a, not a photo a shopped picture. The picture is true, but the endorsement um, is not. Um, I'm going to skip that and talk about some of the consequences. Um, so, in terms of the consequences of this micro-targeted strategy, um, one is that what you found is that because the candidates are spending uh, their money more efficiently, they, um, they calculate for each individual voter your predicted probability of voting and your predicted probability of voting for them. And they map those two together and they cut a threshold, right? They don't need to spend a lot of money on their ones and they don't want to waste their money on people that have no chance of voting or no chance of voting for them. They're trying to, to, to target to that middle. So what's happened is, and that's kind of hard to see, but what's happened over time is that this has meant that they have ignored those people, especially who are unlikely to vote. And so this just breaks whether or not somebody gets uh, contacted by a campaign by um, party registration. And um, you, you 
probably can't see the line, but the 20%, 7%. So it's always been the case that those who are registered to vote are, have been more likely to be contacted by a campaign. That's always been the case. But that gap has grown from, you know, a 7% and 20% gap to a 14% to a 58% gap for those who are registered to vote in a battleground state. So we've had this, you know, explosion in the inequality in mobilization attempts. So that the, the, the people who are um, not registered to vote are are essentially getting left out of the process, and nobody's asking them to join the process. And there are the nonpartisan groups that are, you know, trying, and there are all the caveats about some of the things going on this election cycle. But even still. Right, you know, where is Obama putting the majority of his money in terms of mobilizing the youth vote into college campuses, not into you know the the uncollege educated and, and and so on. And so and so this inequality in mobilization attempts is something that that um, although it, it might have shrunk a tiny bit this election cycle, it, the overall trend um, is one that seems quite undemocratic. Um, another uh, consequence. Um, is this, you know, 75 different policy issues that were being talked about in the campaign. Um, and, and again, um, the Fidel Castro example, I think, uh, helps to highlight the fact that this is not, uh, this election cycle, a similar thing is, is going on, right? You, you know, where, where the headlines are talking about the, the economy, on the ground there are many other messages um, uh, that are going out. And, and so there's this fragmentation of the policy agenda so that, that um, some people are, are uh, being told that the issues they care about are a priority um, to the candidate and the, your neighbor is being told that their pet issue is also a priority to the candidate. Well, come time to govern, not all of those issues can be a top priority. And, and it's going to create um, it does create um, problems uh, when it comes to governance. And we certainly saw this um, with George Bush, where nobody in his coalition was kept happy. The, the uh, you know, Christian conservatives were told that moral issues in their direct mail, and they were told that moral issues were a priority. And so, you know, they were thrilled when Terry Schiavo was um, being the, the topic of discussion, but upset when Social Security was the first policy initiative that, that um, Bush tried to, to take on. Um, in his new term, whereas the the people who were being told that you know small business issues were were really his priority were upset with the Terry Shiva. So so the the coalition that has to be built for an election um, it, it has consequences um, come time for uh, governance. Um, and then you also have this focus on um, issues that that some would argue are superficial. Not to say that you know. Um, um, snowmobiling policy is not an important issue uh, to some people, but this was the focus of you know, direct mail and phone calls to a number of people in 2006 and 2004 because there was a list of people who owned snowmobiles, and so the Republican Party was sending messages that said, you know, the Republican candidate's going to be the best candidate for snowmobiling policy. Now, this might upset the rest of the country to hear that this is what is being sold as a top priority um, rather than, at the time, right, the Iraq war and the economy. And so there's this concern that, that through micro-targeting that there's really a focus on, on um, issues that are important to a, a small group, but again, might not be um, important to the broader community. Um, so. Uh, where does this leave us in terms of 2004, you know, interpretations that really was all about voters, you know, the, the values voters, uh, really was a misinterpretation uh, of the election. The vast majority of people, you know, cared about Iraq and not about um, gay marriage. Um, but it's not surprising that the, the traditional media um, came to this conclusion because for some, for those Christian conservatives, they were being told that, you know, um, these moral issues were in fact um, a priority to, to Bush. And so for them, that's what the election was at, about. At the same time that, that some 30 other segments um, in every state, so every state had, all the battleground states had about 30 different um, target groups. Um, they were all be to being told that, that some other issue um, was also at, um, at stake. And so it makes it difficult for us to, you know, say after the election is all said and done, what the will of the people really was. 
right? Because um, different people were being told the different issues were important, and so we're voting on the basis of, of different, you know, messages that they were sending to the candidates. And so uh, when it's all said and done, you know, we would like to believe that there's a clear message being sent as a result of an election, that there's a mandate that, that if one candidate wins, we know exactly what that candidate has been instructed to do based on the votes of the people. And that's no longer possible given um, the diversity and complexity of the campaign agenda that they are selling uh, to the American public. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop um, there and open up um, discussion, especially because um, I didn't really talk about this election much, and I'm happy to. So, <laughs> um, thank you for your talk. It was great. See, uh, my, my, the, the glaring obvious question that comes out of this is, uh, relates to what your sense is just sort of a plea for you to continue extrapolating what you've talked about in the context of email and of the current campaign. Um, it would seem like email and the you know growth of computing power and the ability to manage large data sets would mean that for marginal cost you could just mine the heck out of these kinds of databases, send an infinite number of messages for basically zero amounts of dollars compared to what it takes to send direct mail with a right. stamp you know stamp on it. So um, is that you know what, is that prophecy being fulfilled? Is that basically what's happening, or is there a better story to tell? So, so the, there's, um, there's something about the email that makes it a little bit interesting, and, and I should say that we have a little bit of data from 2004. I was hoping to be able to do the study in 2008 and didn't have the funding, and so um, we don't have, you know, the, kind of the, the detail of data that we had in 2004. Um, but there's something that's slightly different. Because um, email is so cheap, you can do one of two things, right? It, it's You don't have to spend your money, your email, as efficiently. So you can, in fact, send it to people with a very general message. So so on the one hand, you do find very much so the micro-targeting, mm -hmm. right, in, in political email. Um, um, but a couple different things are going on. One is that a lot of the emails are going to people who have signed up online. And so, number one, the people who are signing up online tend to be the base, not persuadable voters. And it's now very cheap and easy to, to contact those base people. And so it's not necessarily a, a clear indication of overall kind of campaign strategy. Um, and then in terms of um, email spam, um, there um, are some internal studies going on um, that I know on the progressive side are trying to figure out, you know, to what extent do we hurt ourselves, right, um, to, to, to spam people. Um, and I don't know what we, we don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> sorry. Email and mailing TV broadcasts are all one-way venues, right? Mm -hmm. And one of what's new, I think, in this election is that there was a lot of interactive media involved, Facebook campaigns, you know, people being able to download YouTube videos of mm -hmm. things that had just happened. Um, so there's a lot of more interaction across, uh, you know, the election <coughs> too. Uh, how do you see this impacting, you know, the research you've done before and the insights you came up with, you know, given this change in landscape? So um, at the same time that it's become interactive, right, and and we, the, the the candidates are very fearful of that, right? Um, and where this has become most apparent is is I mean, it's definitely true, you know, that you. Obama girl, right? People say, wait, is that supposed to be pro-Obama or not, right? Like, is this helping him or hurting him? And so there's always that concern that you, you know, give the message to somebody else and it's not going to be a message that you want. And so both campaigns, where, where this was, I think, really obvious is both campaigns tried to uh, really crack down on people contributing money to third parties interest groups, right, 527s, and, and both had sent the signal, we want money to come to us centrally. For McCain, that was, the, you know, the RNC. Um, for Obama, it was to his campaign. We want it here. We don't want it in the hands of the, the third parties um, or in the, the you know, the, the interest groups. Um, at the end of the campaign, though, and, and actually you see this, so that a couple of weeks ago, I think the totals were um, like 150 million was contributed to um, interest groups, um, whereas in 2004 the number was 450 million. And um, you get, you know, a lot of um, 
if you know if you're the the NRA, um, you are kind of uh, very much going to focus your message on your issue, um, and and not necessarily concerned about kind of the overall theme of the campaign. Uh, at the end of the campaign, both candidates signaled that they perhaps wouldn't mind if people started spending money on their behalf. But at that point, there's no way that I think that we'll see the catch up uh, to the level that we saw in 2004. So as a way of maybe not answering your question <laughs> very well, but, but, but there is no doubt that, that the campaign has become more interactive, that the, the swirl of information that people have received about the campaign has become more interactive and is not just coming from the candidates, but the candidates themselves uh, want to try and control that message um, as much as possible. And that, I think that's going to be an ongoing uh, tension. Um. I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to examine um, voter to voter communication. Because the reason that I'm thinking that might be important in what you're talking about is there has to be some threshold at which this micro targeting is going to break down because people are going to say, well, I got an email saying he's for abortion or whatever. And so I'm just wondering if that's something that's interesting to you to study mm -hmm. to find out how much this strategy can really work. Um, um, absolutely. And, and so the question is, is can. Is there a way for those uh, messages to filter up, right? And we've seen a little bit of that, but still not very much because it's so much more difficult to track um, emails and the source of emails, right, uh, compared to television ads where you can respond the same day and get your message out. And so there is an attempt, right? Um, and so, you know, we've seen where whether it's candidates at the presidential level or certainly at, at lower levels where they you know are trying to do the viral campaign right to, to get um, friends on the blogs to you know blog favorable things um, and and to make it look more voter to voter than candidate to voter and and mm -hmm. the, both sides um, are are fully aware um, that all research shows that the the, the most uh, persuasive appeal uh, come from people that you know, and and there is um, broad recognition of that, and so um, there is no doubt that the the campaigns have have tried to um, incorporate um, voter to voter to, to get their message through voter to voter communications um, in a variety of different ways. Hi. <clears throat> So um, everything you've talked about so far has been, I, I guess, uh, messages where the party or the campaign was clearly identified as the source of that message. And right. I'm interested in dirty tricks. Yeah. As a dirty person. Um, and you know, we've in the last few years we've seen things like uh, phone jamming in Ohio uh, or or uh, fake flyers and. Yeah, phone Virginia jamming though is actually uh, party sanctioned right. in uh, New Hampshire. <laughs> so. But in both of those cases, you know, the FBI was able to the source of the activity, even if they weren't able to send these guys to jail, they were able to at least identify the source within a few days or a few weeks. And as we shift to more internet-based technologies, we have the possibility of using these zombie botnets on the internet to send spam, or anonymous voice over IP calls from India or China that mm -hmm. can then be used to send out misinformation and voter uh, repression efforts, or suppression efforts. So I guess I'm wondering, um, if, as we shift to these technologies, where uh, candidates and parties and other groups can send out false and anonymous messages. Mm -hmm. How does that change the playing field? So, um, I mean, I think that we've certainly seen it in this election cycle, right, in, in a pretty major way. I have a survey that um, I have to to finish up today, and one of the things that I'm asking about is, is um, the you know, were people receiving forwarded emails? You know, in the past when we've asked about kind of, you know, have you received a political email, we just did it very generally. But it's important to know the difference between whether it's a voter-to-voter -voter personalized message versus, you know, this forwarded chain um, mail that is coming from a source that, that we don't necessarily know. And we don't know, um, we, so we do know in terms of just political persuasion, right, that, that um, number one, negative messages are more effective than positive messages. Um, that messages from someone you know are more persuasive than from someone you don't know. But we don't yet know, right, if that negative message comes from, comes forwarded from someone you know, but they, the um, original source you don't know, 
do people discount it or can they even distinguish? Um, because as I'm sure some of you saw these chain emails, they were actually written so that it looked like it was you know, just forwarded once, right? Um, a friend of mine sent this along and that, that same that same tagline was used to go all over the country where, you know, my, my sister's aunt told me that, you know, Obama had, you know, such and such. And, and um, it, it was trying, it's worded in such a way to try and make it look much more personal and familiar than, um, you know, in reality it is. And so I, I think it's an, it's an area that we don't know enough about, um, but, but has absolutely changed, changed the dynamic. And, and, um, I, I think that there's not even a consensus on from the campaign strategy side whether you ignore, acknowledge, um, counteract, um, you know what the appropriate response is, um, and, and and I don't think there have been any internal studies. Of that. It's interesting you mentioned that some of my colleagues at Indiana University did a study where they sent fake emails to people tending to be from their social networking friends. So they mined Facebook, they collected people's social graphs, and then they sent phishing emails to people trying to trick them into entering their users and passwords. And they had saw a 400% increase in, in effectiveness of phishing attacks. So it'd be really interested to see if, if a, a campaign could mine Facebook and then send false forwarded messages to people <laughs> pretending to be from their friends, see if that would have, um, sorry, I'm a bad guy, but um, <laughs> see if that would be more effective. Yeah. That, that probably wouldn't be approved by the uh, Human Subject Review Committee at Harvard, but um, it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. I've been dealing with this in my work with indigenous populations across countries, and the way I have handled it, and it's not perfect, but it's a teaching standard where you verify possibly responding and then look for alternative media actual media where you place a call into one of the campaigns and that becomes a teaching process where and as much as we all love the internet and believe me i do and i use it it has been very helpful uh, for this campaign i found out that on the msn website for massachusetts they had the wrong close of registration for be becoming a registered voter i found it out on friday it was fixed process was, and if we start teaching the kids when they start using the internet and using the emails that because of technology there are a few gaps in this, you want to trust friends and double verify from a newspaper, a phone call, you know, something else, a radio program, something else, because that has not all been coordinated to be manipulated. One of the things I'll be able to see is um, um, one of the projects I'm working on right now is it's been a, um, a multi-wave panel over the course of the campaign tracing um, individuals from starting a, a year ago. And um, so I've been asking every wave, we're now in wave 10, um, you know, have you been to a website? Have you been getting these emails? And so we can look to see if for instance, there's more um, error, you know, we ask one question was, you know, what's the first word that comes to mind when you hear Obama and when you hear um, McCain? And we can look to see if there's kind of more references to some of the, you know, negative rumors um, among those people who were more active online and, and those weren't, who weren't. And I haven't looked at that yet, but uh, I intend to. <laughs> you so there's been quite a bit of debate about increasing political polarization within the U.S. Bill Bishop's got a book out, big sort, you know, basically announcing that none of us actually know our neighbors anymore. We've all sorted ourselves into homogenous districts. We're actually pretty good evidence of this. It's pretty hard <laughs> for us to find McCain t-shirt or lawn sign or anything around here. Um, you seem to be suggesting that that's wrong or that it's more complicated than that. Um, I... Uh, I think you're absolutely right that that um, that the way that I would pitch the story is that it is absolutely the case that um, our campaigns, our candidates, our politicians have polarized, um, and to some extent they are uh, talking about you know the 
cultural issues and polarization because there's an incentive to, not because the public has polarized. And in fact, when I, and I didn't go through all this evidence, but uh, in The Persuadable Voter, what I show is, is that the, the issues on which people disagree with their party, people are more likely to disagree on social issues like abortion and gay marriage and stem cell research than on economic issues. And that means that there's more of an incentive for candidates to talk about social issues than economic issues, even though most people might want to focus on economic issues. And so there's this perverse incentive structure um, that's created um, because of, you know, the, um, you know, technology and, but also even just the, uh, you know, the electoral system. Um, and so I, I think that, that um, by and large, what you find is that, that partisans are correctly sorted you agree with, if you're a Democrat, you agree with the Democrats more than the Republicans. You agree with them more on economic issues and social issues. Um, but most people still, there's something that they disagree with their party on. Isn't there an opportunity for a smart politician here somewhere to break out of this trap of increasing polarization, which seems to be the strategy that's come into play. Let's ignore presidential for a moment and, and, and deal with House of Representatives, for instance, where we see increasing evidence of uh, ideological polarization. If you're suggesting that there's actually a large mass of voters and perhaps a majority of voters who are not in lockstep with their own party, you know, isn't there the possibility for someone to show up and say, hey, I'm really moderate? Yep. Uh, and, and, you know, I listen to people and I get along and I might sort of change my mind and, you know, here and I'm squishy and mold, mold me in your own fashion. Why aren't we, as if a matter you're of writing fact, about persuadability, why aren't we What we that? saw in 2006. So, so keep in mind that the, the micro-targeting really, you know, really got started in 2004. Um, a little bit 2002, but, but um, 2006, what we saw is that the way that Democrats often took wedge issues off the table was to put up candidates who were pro-life, right? If, if that was going to be a potential issue that could be raised in their district, then they tried to take it off the table. Um, and, and that's less likely to happen at the presidential level, but even there, we've kind of seen it this cycle. And, and it's something that frankly surprised uh, me and a lot of other political scientists that you have you know, McCain and Obama much closer on immigration than you would have expected given the potential for that to become a wedge issue. Um, and so you certainly, um, at the, the uh, congressional level in particular, that, that if it's clear that, you, that your co potential coalition is vulnerable to some type of wedge appeal, that you can undercut that by you know, adopting a more moderate position. This is related a little bit to your question. I have, I have two questions about, um, one, one, how do you see the way that wedge issues evolve over the campaigns? Because wh one thing, I guess the particular ones that have been really um, striking to me, uh, one is gay marriage, that you had Sarah Palin and Joe Biden both being like, yeah, well, fine, whatever, cool. And the, it, it, I mean, right. whoa, yeah, that's, okay. example, that's really right. different from the, the tone, at least, of the, the national uh, exposure of that in the last election. Um, the other one being in, in the longer past, welfare and what, what used to be a huge, huge wedge issue, just gone, really, right. as, a, as something. And then also social security, which is more of the, the, the technical issue, which was a huge buzzword in the 2000 election, is just not at all discussed right now, it seems like, even though it's still a really huge um, problem. So I'm wa wondering about those, maybe specifically the evolution. Uh, and then as, as an even broader question, um, I'm wondering about your perspective as a political scientist and, and an academic researcher uh, looking the, at this and, and not having a, a concern necessarily about the partisan outcomes but about governance outcomes in general and looking at you know what what are the recommendations that come out of this sort of, of research about mass communication about issues and about governance mandates and you know how, how do we understand what the public wants what's good based on an election like this Right. So let me take the first one first, because actually I, I, both are terrific questions. Um, so the emergence of an issue um, is very interesting, and, and I traced um, a few in the book. I think stem cell research is a nice example. Um, so the, the evolution of stem cell research was that in 2000, nobody knew anything about stem cell research. 
it was never talked about. It was not mentioned in the debates. It was not mentioned in the platforms. It was not mentioned on the candidate websites. Um, there was no mention of, of stem cell research except that Bush sent a letter uh, to um, Catholic bishops saying that he um, was opposed to stem cell research. So he made the first move. He made the first move in, in an appeal uh, to Catholics, a traditionally democratic constituency, that he was trying to pick up, right, by, by saying, aha, like, you're the only people out there. They're thinking about stem cell research and abortion and, and other number of things. But that was, that was a, kind of the really the first emergence of stem cell research in the campaign. Nobody knew about it. Poll numbers were finding that, you know, 50% of people said they didn't have enough information to say if they had an opinion or not. Okay, this emerges as an issue over the course of the first term, where um, there are congressional hearings, um, there is movement in terms of policy, but at that point, Bush has wedded himself to a particular position. If you, we look through all the kind of internal documents about whether or not he was going to kind of stand by his opposition to stem cell research. Um, in one of his ve his very first uh, television addresses to the nation was to say that he was, you know, going to cut off funding for stem cell research except for existing lines. The very first, right? And and it was actually debated whether or not that was what he should do because as the issue started emerging, most as public as the public started to become aware of the issue it was clear that he was on the wrong side of the issue and yet he was he was already wedded to it because of a move that he made in the campaign this created the potential for a wedge issue for the democrats so what do we see in 2004 somebody who was speaking prime time at the democratic convention was reagan's son and he explicitly said right i'm not making a political speech here i'm making a speech about stem cell research yeah, okay, it was a political speech. It was an appeal to those um, pro-stem cell research Republicans who now, right, this, is a, this was a, a wedge issue. And so um, I, I did the same thing on, on racial policy, civil rights policy. But the emergence of an issue, it depends, right? You know, some things there is, you know, gay marriage, for instance, there was the Massachusetts court ruling. Um, it's also the case that there are the interest groups who are trying to force issues onto the public agenda. So ballot initiatives are a new tool that interest groups and activists use to try and get um, an issue that they think is going to be an advantage on the ballots and into the public discussion. Minimum wage was one that the Democratic activists were pushing on to um, um, uh, state ballots, and of course gay marriage is one that Republicans um, were. And so um, it, it creates this interesting dynamic where um, as the public either reveals their opinions or comes to learn their opinions, that you come to find out whether or not something is going to be a winnable wedge or not. Um, Gay marriage, I think, this election, particular election cycle is, I think, interesting um, from the fact that, especially in broadcast messages and television, that there is such a sense that people don't want to talk about little issues, right? They don't want to talk about superficial politics, that, that there is concern for the backlash that, wait a second, don't talk about the thing, like, focus on the things that we care about. And so you still see it in the ground war communications, but but I think the candidates are being and and more than we've act, we've certainly seen the last couple of election cycles, you know, you have the issues like immigration and I mean the the candidates were, were the same on gay marriage um, last election cycle too. But okay, so the other question was about um, a really tough one <laughs> that the political philosophers deal with all the time, right? And and that is is, you know, what you know, what does this all mean normatively, like in, in terms of democracy um, and, and what we should take away from um, an election? There is no doubt that elections have always been a very blunt measure of the public will. Um, and, um, and candidates and the winning candidate supplement information from an election with information, right, like both sides are saying, look, there's a chance I can win because look at how many people are at the rally and what the people are saying at the rally. Well, the rallies are not a representation of the entire uh, nation. Um, and so um, just to not really answer the question, maybe um, to, to highlight something that's important to me, and that is survey research, that, that one of the things that we see um, that, that is critically important and has been for many decades is that, that 
that polls are one of the few ways that everyone has an equal voice, <laughs> right, is it that you can find out um, public opinion. Um, but it's important to remember that um, at the congressional level, the, pre right, the president is the only person who has the entire nation as his con constituency. And um, what matters for policymaking, right, are the, the, con the constituency preferences, um, the people who actually go and show up at the polls, and what their opinions are in individual states and in individual districts. And so um, policy outcomes, are, you know, there, there are many different actors who are all interested in the same thing, which is re-election, um, but it, it sometimes is going to, to pull them in different directions. And so looking at the, the kind of prospects for governing um, for the, the next president, they're pretty crummy. Um, and that is even if um, Obama was to get, um, you know, a Democrat, keep a Democratic majority um, in Congress. Uh, of course, the important thing is whether or not there's a filibuster-proof um, uh, Senate. Um, even if you get a filibuster-proof Senate, so you get the 60, um, you then have to contend with the fact that there are a lot of Democrats, conservative Democrats, who are not going to go for, um, you know, liberal policy uh, changes. And so, um, and we saw this, you know, Clinton had a Democratic Congress when he was first elected, and um, the public... Yeah, I mean, so so one of the questions that political scientists are ask, asking now is, you know, really, who wants to um, <laughs> take take over at this point? Because uh, you're really going to there's so many challenges and so many um, hurdles to kind of actually making policy change. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps to answer gets everyone depressed here on election day. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> question uh, from a European perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this kind of micro-targeting and uh, we don't see that as much in, uh, in, in European countries. And uh, I guess one of the reasons is, is that we have privacy uh, regulations that put quite heavy restrictions on uh, processing of, uh, of data about people's mm -hmm. uh, political opinions. So uh, there is, however, like a uh, growing uh, industry of uh, campaign uh, experts that that are looking uh, at the U.S. Uh, situation. I think this would be, uh, of course, a great thing uh, to be able to micro-target much better. Uh, and I can see uh, in, like, at the moment we have kind of like the start of the renegotiation process about this uh, privacy directive. And I can see that probably also this industry is going to try to get some kind of uh, like a lower standard for this uh, process. And uh, so I wonder uh, how, how does your research fit into that de debate about like, so uh, I can see in the one hand, like you, you express your concerns about this, uh, uh, about the effects of the micro target. And on, on the other hand, it does uh, give political parties and others like a better way to connect to, to voters. So I was wondering if you could say something. About yeah, and, and I mean, you're exactly right that, 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 that you know, that one of the key pieces is having information about individual voters. And, um, you know, the, the, so the key is the fact that the campaigns and, and parties have this information, you know, about um, each voter. And you can say, you know, why is it that they get access to the voter rolls? And all the justification for giving um, access to voter rolls is this, it's good for democracy because then you mobilize. Right, because then it, it makes it easy to mobilize. But but what it um, doesn't take into account is how only subsets are being mobilized. And so um, there is, uh, I think I've seen some legal scholars, in fact, um, talking about micro-targeting. Um, I'm trying to remember who exactly it was for those of you who might be interested um, in this. But um, Michael Kang. Um, who's a law professor at Emory has a piece talking about how great it is that you know all of a sudden you can have you know mobilization efforts going um, to you know more voters and we know that you know this is a good thing for democracy to have more people mobilized and and what it misses is the fact that that money is being spent more efficiently it's not just across the board um, mobilization um, I think if there was a big push. Um, then this could at least be more of a public debate, uh, but the people who would have to, to decide are the same people who have an incentive to keep the information, right? So. But it's, it's not only the voter roll records, though. I, I had the, the 
impression that they buy in to all the massive databases that are there, like including yeah. all the consumer yeah. information. Yes, like absolutely. about this pros and cons of mobilizing the base or something broader. Um, well, basically here, if you think about micro-targeting, it's, it's pretty much, to me at least, as a European, uh, a way of reinforcing the structure of power, right? Because you essentially send the message to these people there. Plus, if you, if you use, and that's, but that's an advantage for campaigning, right? Plus, if you use the uh, technology for uh, gaining more mo for receiving more money, then you spend this money on, uh, well, TV advertisement, for instance, right? Again, to reinforce the message from the top. So essentially, in Europe, you, you can't really micro-target target because of the data protection laws. You can't really spend that much money on TV uh, ads because of the, the stru financial right. structure of how you finance the, the campaign. And then, well, I, I, I don't really have a, uh, my point on this, but I wonder whether there's more, there are more pros on, or cons for using this technology in a way which actually uh, influences the base from the top more than it's possible in a European uh, situation, for instance, because, because the structure in Europe does not really allow you you it as does, a politician it doesn't to influence it that much. To, in a lot I, of I um, other um, political systems, you do the coalition building after the election rather than before. And so, I mean, I think you're both absolutely right to point out that there are these kind of institutional and structural differences that, that make for a completely different um, campaign environment. Um, in terms of lining up the pros and cons, I'll leave that to somebody else. I mean, I just, <laughs> I, I want to point out, you know, that, that, so, you know, there are a lot of people who just say, like, oh, technology is, the, the impact has been all great. Um, that, you know, it's, it's allowed people to become more active more easily if you're interested in politics. And, and one of the things that, um, you know, it's, it's allowed people to reach out to, to people who haven't been involved in politics before. And all those things are true. And so I'm not sure that we can balance off and say which is, which is better and, you know, uh, at the end, is it, is it all good or bad? Um, I just want to point out that this dynamic is, is going on. And, and, and at, the, at the end of the day, the thing to also remember is, is people make up their mind not just on the basis of that text message or that forwarded email or the, even the email appeal from their friend. They're making up their mind on the basis of all the information that they learned during the campaign. And so you look at 2008 and, you know, damn it, right? This is, this is an election cycle where it's, it has... It looks as if, right, McCain has not been able to um, really utilize wedge issues to any great extent because whatever is being said on the ground, that people are still overwhelmingly concerned about um, the economy, right? And so um, there, are, you know, there are lim and and the, the I guess the key thing I want to point out is just that even if, like in 2008, that um, at the end of the day, you know these these you know sophisticated campaigning techniques don't have a big impact on voters they have an impact on the candidates and and that's an important thing um, to to recognize the major advantage of, of the system here is that after all it it rises the level of awareness among the uh, constituents comparing at least to the European system where pretty pretty often people just guess going to the poll, I mean, it... Well, they have a party, right? I mean, yeah, in a, yeah, especially in a yeah, yeah. parliamentary type system, you, 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 it, there's not the same incentive structure because it's, it's, it's more kind of party um, based. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons. Can I ask two kind of wrap up style uh -huh. questions? One, uh, what do you think the biggest surprise thus far has been in the 2008 cycle? Mm -hmm. and a prediction for 2010 or 2012? 
What do you what do you think another like a future iteration of this is? Whether 2012 is too far off, but sort of recognizing sure. the, the, the so I'll do the nature. first one, uh, the last one first, and and that is one of the things we've seen is beyond just um, merging in information from consumer databases. Now companies and, and campaigns are looking to scrape other information they can gather about individuals. So um, one uh, company has advertised that they're developing technology to scrape. Um, uh, resumes on the internet and so that way you can put into the database right not just your turnout history and not just you know your magazine subscriptions but also information from your resume that my you know so sociology majors are more likely to be democratic and business majors are more likely to be uh, Republican and so again um, more information there is no turning the clock I think on the type of information society, information economy that we have. And so I think what we'll find is just um, more and more information about each individual voter is, and, and I think getting back to the point that sometimes it's wrong, um, what candidates are going to find is that they sometimes are going to run the risk that even somebody, you know, who owns a gun, um, they might not be, um, you know, all that supportive of, you know, the Republican on a, a different set of issues. And so they're, you know, they're going to run into, at some point, right, so much information, it's not clear exactly um, how they'll um, incorporate it. Um, okay, the surprising thing from 2008, and I don't know if this is the most surprising, but I just think it's hilarious um, and for this group. So um, Obama has so much money, right? And so he has done some things that, um, Number one, because he knows if he can get young people out, that this this is a cons you know a group that breaks very much for him relative um, to uh, McCain, and so he's done advertising on uh, video games. Um, is it the Second Life? Is that the what the so you know that the uh, there's a there's a big kind of uh, not big right. This is this is cheap relative to other campaigning, but you know it makes for a nice headline, and you know it is this you know great comparison to McCain who doesn't know how to work Google so um, so there was a friend of mine who's been working on uh, the Republican campaign um, ask about their technology um, efforts and uh, was talking about Obama's efforts on video games and stuff and, he, and they said that in fact that there was a McCain is it a McCain avatar on Second Life? And so they had one, um, but um, the, Demo the um, Obama supporters in Second Life had um, uh, double parked in front of his apartment, and so he can't get out. <laughs> and so <laughs> the entire campaign, the McCain avatar has been stuck in his apartment <laughs> with the Obama supporters spray painting um, on the, <laughs> the side of his apartment building. Um, and so uh, I think that <laughs> I think that, that probably this election cycle, the kind of the technological gap between the candidates. Um, has been uh, very striking, and and you know I think that that to some extent, uh, you know, all the talk about young voters, uh, I think has been a little bit overblown. Uh, the turnout rate of young people is so so pathetic that even if you have record-breaking numbers among young people, it comes nowhere close uh, to the numbers of other uh, uh, cohorts. Um, but, um, and so I suspect that, you know, the, the headline might be there were record numbers, but, um, you know, when you start at 28% of, you know, 18 to 20 year olds are voting in 2000, you can increase that by 10 percentage points and you still are not getting up to, you know, the 52 to 60% turnout rate of their parents. Um, and so, you know, but again, Obama's had the money to, to still play and appeal to this group, and, and so I think that has made for um, some interesting campaign uh, stories, if, if uh, nothing else. So the biggest surprise is the Second Lifers save the election for Obama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, uh, so everyone, please join me in thanking Sunshine for a moment.